We're coming to you today from the Psychedelic Science 2017 conference here in Oakland, California, where the world experts, scientists, researchers, doctors, medical professionals, psychologists, scholars are here spreading their wisdom and findings from their research about psychedelics in all forms, in all applications. And they're here to send a clear message to us that the psychedelics are a gateway for our consciousness to access new plateaus. Yeah, now that's what I'm talking about. Let's go check this out. What was that piece, Mike? Something I just made up on the spur of the moment. Oh my God. What can we say? Mike Crowley. Mike's book is The Secret Drugs of Buddhism. And, and the origins, sorry, psychedelic sacraments and the origins of the Vajrayana. That's the full title. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And you've, you've brought this wisdom to the Psychedelic Science 2017 conference to share with the attendees and of course with the world. Everything here is live stream. Your book is available so we can read every word that you put down. It's available on Amazon. I'm trying to get it more widely available into bookstores and so on. But uh, as I'm handling it all myself, it's... It's tedious and time consuming, but this helps. We're going to give you a boost. Yeah. And uh, we love the insights that we're finding here at the conference, exactly the type of wisdom that you present in your book, I'm, your teaching. I'm, I'm not so sure it's wisdom, it's certainly information. Okay. Uh, there's a lot That's of information right. in there. It's, there is a bit of a modern um, debate. It's not really a heated debate. It's, cool debate about the relevance of psychedelics to modern Buddhist practice. Well, that's all well and good, but mine is about the actual historical evidence for uh, a period when psychedelics were integrated fully into uh, Buddhist practice, both uh, uh, communally and personally, on a ritual level, ceremonially used. And still is to this day, if only in uh, in the form of coloured water with lots of blessings. But um, there was originally a psychedelic sacrament, and I I trace the history from uh, prehistoric times through the soma of the uh, Vedic period to Amrita used in tantric Hinduism and tantric Buddhism. So. If there was anything wise about this book, what would you say the wisdom is? I think it's um, drugs aren't the only thing. That there is uh, there are practices to do. There is meditations to learn and vows to keep and ethics and so on that go along with this. They're not they're not in and of itself a spiritual path, but they are an adjunct to it. Apart from that. I would say the wisest thing I've ever learned, regardless of the drugs, is something a uh, Tibetan Lama said in the 1970s, I think, when teaching a course on an advanced Tibetan philosophy called Dzogchen. And the students were a little confused after a while. And they said, could you just sum it up in a couple of sentences? And he took this very literally and he said, Okay, first sentence, don't believe your own bullshit. Second sentence, enjoy the view. Bravo. Yeah. So I've always, I, I'm personally, I have two goals in life. When one is, the first and primary goal is to, to comfort the disturbed. And the second one is to disturb the comfortable. So, so, but oh my God. but <laughs> let's talk about the book. Um, Fair enough. What do these people want to know about the book? 
what, what's the, um, well, give us a good reason to read it. It's kind uh, of thick. Yes, it's kind of <laughs> thick. It's 460 pages. Okay. Um, it's, I, there's no fluff. It, it's, it's just solid information. And the reason someone might want to read it is that it legitimizes the use of psychedelics in a sane and responsible manner uh, for spiritual progress and shows that for hundreds of years they were used perfectly well, perfectly safely in this manner um, and when used with great respect and, uh, and used in a, in a spiritual context. So, no, they don't send you crazy, they may send you enlightened. But, but basically, that's the, um, the, the underlying message of the book. But as I said earlier, they won't do it on their own. You need, you need a practice, you need a meditation, you need to, to fill in the gaps between the drug experiences. So do you think that this combination of the deep spiritual, personal spiritual practice, and potentially some influence of these psychedelics, is the antidote to uh, uh, the type of organized religion where we're following leaders, where it's influencing politics, defining our, our value system? Uh, Yes, I, I'm, I'd like to nuance the following leaders thing a bit. Um, in that, in the, yes, I, I say generally, yes, that is the answer to that. But there, often um, we come up against the, the question of gurus. And it, the term means a different thing in the West to what it does in the East. In the East, a guru is somebody who brings you to enlightenment. He's not somebody who requires that you worship him. And, and uh, so there are many ways in which a guru can bring you to enlightenment. And I think the, um, the use of drugs is one way. But then again, he is not a leader. Right. In fact, we're told in the, on the, the tantric path that anything can be your, your guru. If something upsets you, that, that shows that's, that's a guru. That shows you know, um, a certain... Uh, aspect of your mind that you have to work on and um, disappointment is a great guru it shows you yes. what you w when you are attached to uh, specific outcomes <laughs> and so so easy uh, so these are not leaders these are teachers and, teachers exactly. and and I'm just wanted to make that distinction I love uh, that it's perfect so, so there you go is it the antidote to seeking someone to worship rather than a teacher. Now, there is a, uh, a very profound co uh, koan in Zen Buddhism, which is one of the early ones, one of the beginner's koans, but it, it's very, very profound. And it, the question is not formed as a question, the koan is, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Now, the question is why? Why should you kill the Buddha if you meet him on the road? Well, the reason is he's an imposter. Uh, there is only one Buddha, and it's you. So, uh, so don't go looking for enlightenment outside of yourself. It's within. It's you can't find it in this enlightened person or that guru or this barber or, or this building or, or this building you yes. know with the beautiful the rose churches, windows you yes. know they're, yes. they're beautiful yes yeah. but and you feel nice when you go in there yes. but that's not it yeah and there's it's, a sense of communion there there's a lot of benefit and value there but su subscribing to the doctrine seems like it pit, it puts us in a hole where we're, we're well, cornered and I, we can't can't the, experience what life has to teach us the world doesn't come in doctrines, you know, there is no doctrine inherent in existence, in just, I mean, this is wandering rather distantly from the book. I was just thinking the same I, thing, but I love it uh, nonetheless. But, um, <laughs> if we think about the world dispassionately, it's just undifferentiated stuff. It's only us that say, that's an interviewer, that's a camera. Um, these, uh, we break it up into things. The Buddhist goal is to recognize the fundamental no-thingness of, 
of the world. I love and, that. Uh, and it's not the same as nothingness, no. which is how it's been misinterpreted. Yeah. It's there, but it doesn't have to be the form that your symbols and labels and language and story led you to be convinced that it is. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. And oh, we, that's so good. We, and Are uh, these t the type of wisdom you can access through the secret drugs of Buddhism? Um, you, you can access it through meditation, too. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and so it's... Um, Basically, my book is not about, is not the distilled wisdom of the ages. That would be a very, very different book. Sure. This is about an actual history of actual use of actual plants, mushrooms, and uh, several, several different mushrooms, and a, um, an Indian form of ayahuasca, uh, some, uh, some grasses. Um, well, let, me ask, let me ask you this then. It, what is the oldest usage of the psilocybin mushrooms that you found in your book? You, I would indicate? say the oldest mention is the mention of rudras. Uh, there was no word for mushroom in Sanskrit. They, they made sure that it was removed from the language. It's, this is covered in the book. Uh, but there are different kinds of rudras. There are red ones and there are those with a blue throat. Now, I believe they're talking about Amanita muscaria and Psilocybe cubensis, which has a blue staining stem. Now, the word for throat, blue throat is Nila Kanta in Sanskrit, but blue stem is Nila Kanda. You see, it's very Nila close. Kanta, uh, Nila Kanda. Kanda. Yes, so it's very, very similar. And uh, so it seems to be a very simple pun. Later on, we hear of Shiva being called Nilakanta, blue throat, and a lot of the a lot of the references to Shiva seem to be actually about the mushroom. Um, it, the, one of the earliest forms of Shiva is uh, Ekapada, which means one leg. Ekapada. Uh, yeah, one leg or one foot. You hear it in yoga all the time, right? Yes. Ekapada Pashimottanasana, for right, example. Right, right, right. Well, well, Pashupati, the second part of that. Pashupati is the lord of, of cattle. Okay. And the Pashu is cattle. Now, um, as we well know, Psilocybe cubensis, the classic psychedelic mushroom, grows on um, the dung of cattle. And so uh, Shiva's best friend is Nandi the bringer of joy, he with a single shining horn and rounded hump uh, is, the, um, is the bull, which is his vahana or vehicle. And so you could see Nandi as the mushroom also, with one, the, the shining horn being the stem and the rounded hump being the cap of the mushroom. There are lots and lots of uh, more or less uh, overt mushroom references in the Shiva um, cultus. And for instance, in southern India, there are temples called Chatraka, which are the, the, the mushroom shaped temples of Shiva. Chatraka means, um, well, it means both umbrella shaped and mushroom shaped. I'm gonna have to Pinterest that and check it out. Oh, right, <laughs> of course, of course. They have um, a hashtag for that, I guess, I'm, I'm sure. So, well, not yet. Um, I'm very interested actually in the mushroom pillars of Dimapur in Assam, in Nagaland in Assam, which have not yet been thoroughly investigated. Nobody knows who built them or why. Mush huge mushrooms, well, like 12 to 16 feet high, carved with elaborate symbols. And, uh, uh, and they cover a plain which um, is probably rich in mushrooms, the proper mushrooms too, in the monsoon season. I want to go and check it out. Yeah, uh, that's, that's your next book. My right? next, well, actually, my next book is Secret Drugs of Women. Which is about the uh, uh, the possibility that until the early Iron Age, at least within the Indo-European family, uh, psychedelics were a women's mystery, which was subject to uh, patriarchal appropriation during the early Iron Age, 
I, it's, that's what I'm working on now. Uh, lots of myths uh, pointing in that direction, lots of shamanic practices too. And so, but then, yes, I will write a paper on Dilapur, I'm sure. But the, the current book is basically uh, establishing that psychedelic drugs were a part of, um, of Buddhist practice and that they formed a, uh, a long tradition of spiritual use. We know that it existed at least from about 500 to about 1300. So we've got 800 years of, uh, of a well-documented, if you know what you're looking for. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, Do your research. Yeah, mushroom practice. One of the big problems is there is no word for mushroom in Sanskrit. And so they had to say umbrella or parasol, chandra okay. or atapa. Okay. You could also use an elaborate circumlocution like Uchhilindra, which means the sprouting wormy thing. Uchhilindra. Uchhilindra. Oh, Uchhilindra. Yes, and it's a sprouting wormy. <laughs> I know wormy. what to ask for in the countryside. <laughs> oh, nowadays they're called chakras. Chakras? Yeah, wheels. Oh, okay. Wheel. And there's a chapter on wheels and mushrooms. Um, I wish I'd known that the colloquial Hindu for mushroom was wheel. It would have made the chapter a lot easier to write. Um, so well, you paid your dues putting that tome together, and uh, I know it's appreciated. It, you're among an appreciative crowd. Right, right. I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the, the choir here, but that's okay. But, but we, we, this, the idea is to spread ideology beyond this group, right? This is the core group that wants to spread it, right? This is the hip and enlightened. Right, yes. right. Yeah. The, the the early adopters. Yeah, we're yeah. so grateful to be among them and among such. Uh, great contributors to the cause. I, and I, I wish I could share with the viewers the aromas that we are getting <laughs> around here. What smells like some quite exquisite hashish. Yes. So, this is the 420 Lounge at the Psychedelic Conference <laughs> 2017 at Now Share Love. We always love to wrap with a finger hug. All right. <laughs> All the best to you. We're coming up your way. Thanks, Mike. All right. Can we close with a song? I'm fighting the wind. Ah. There's wind going. Can't you just hold up and it blows itself? Or something? <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. Yeah.